Hey, Cross, you so good to be gathering with you today. Hey, we have a few announcements for you. Uh, today is our first day of in-person services. We're so excited. And um, today is all booked up, but after the 1030 service, we're going to have registration for next week's service on the website. Yes, on our website. And yes. each week, you can do that. Yes. And don't, uh, don't be discouraged if you see that the service is full. Mm -hmm. uh, you can sign up. You can continue to try to sign up each week. On MyCrossview.com. On MyCrossview.com. The other thing that we want to announce is we are starting a brand new tech team here at Crossview. As you all know, uh, ministry has uh, a lot of technological parts now, from our podcast to our website to our audio recording to our video recording. All on MyCrossview.com. All on, on MyCrossview.com. <laughs> you can sign up there at MyCrossview.com if you are interested in learning how to do some of that stuff, or maybe you have some experience already. We're, we're putting together a, a, a pretty significant team to help us do all of that stuff now and into the future. It's an exciting opportunity. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, it's going to yeah. be great. And we also have one more announcement for you. Uh, Nikki Roster is starting a small group called Epic of Eden, and it's a journey through the Old Testament, yeah. and it's going to be so cool. Uh, she's just excited to, uh, to have this space for community and for gathering and so that you guys can talk about uh, what it looks like to go through the Old Testament together. Yeah, you can also sign up for that on the website. My Everything MyCrossview.com. Wow. Everything is on the website. So go there and check it out. That's a great opportunity just to get to know some people and, and in a really fun way yeah. study the Old Testament. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. Well, so good to be with you this morning. Yes, it is. Enjoy your service. Okay. See you later. <laughs>
Well, welcome this morning to Crossview Church Online. Welcome to the fifth week of our series, our sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount. And I hope that this series has been speaking deeply to you and to your heart uh, and has been transformative to you each week as we've been looking at this really significant teaching of Jesus. Now, we've covered a lot in only four weeks, and there's a few more weeks to come. The language that we've been using is that this sermon that Jesus taught was unsettling, unsettling to Jesus' hearers, and we acknowledging, acknowledge that it's unsettling for us as well, uh, as Jesus speaks directly to our heart and takes a hard look at how we live our lives. It's really good, but it's really hard stuff. So if... If you don't mind, what I'd like to do this morning is kind of interrupt the progression of our series for just one week. And I'd like to do that because I want to, again, acknowledge something that has been part of our collective experience over the past year. That we have been people in mourning to one degree or another. You know, this is a big day for us and for our church as we begin to hold in-person services again. And as we gather both in person and online, I think it's important to acknowledge the difficulty of this past year while at the same time we recognize the hope that we've had in Jesus and will continue to have in Jesus. So this morning, we're going to rewind a bit just back to one of the Beatitudes in Matthew uh, 5 verse 4 where Jesus says, God blesses those who mourn for they will be comforted. So we're going to look at this today on two levels. First, I want to highlight the unsettling theological aspect of what Jesus is telling his listeners about their spiritual reality. And second, I want to offer us some encouragement through the story of Peter and how God dealt with Peter in a significant moment of Peter's mourning and that we can learn from Peter and we get to see God's goodness to him and then also to us. So first, let's dive into the unsettling theological reality. The word that Jesus uses for mourning in Matthew 5 verse 4 means this. It means to deeply experience sorrow, to be sad, to lament, to grieve, to cry out, to weep. Isn't that a fun set of words? So now remember what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount. He's defining kingdom tendencies that are on display for those who follow him. So the primary emphasis here is that those who follow Jesus will mourn. That is, that they will lament and grieve, cry out to God over their spiritual poverty. That is, those who, feeling their inadequacy to save or help themselves, and and those who recognize their sin or separation from God, mourn and cry out in their need of God. We need a Savior. Uh, I can't go it alone. I don't have the power within me to do that on my own. So in other words, we lament and grieve that which separates us from the very heart of God. To put it simply, this is about recognizing that we are ultimately not in control. Again, that's a fun realization, right? (laughs) It's about recognizing that this world is broken, our society is broken, that we are broken, that we are separated from God and his way, and we should be in desperate need crying out to God, we need you, we can't do this without you. You see, we become mourners when we realize that we are not in control of our own lives or our own internal destiny. We become mourners when we realize that there are things here and now that are keeping us separated from the very heart of God. We become mourners when we realize that even today, I can't create within myself what's needed for holiness, godliness, even for this very moment right now. Now, this all becomes so clear when something like the pandemic hits, and we add on top of that all these other layers of cultural division and struggle. We experience the world as thrown into chaos, and we start to ask, what is going on? And we have this collective experience of grieving. So this first aspect of mourning that Jesus addresses addresses is is crying out to God because we're separated from God and we need his help for life here and now and into eternity. The second aspect of mourning centers around the brokenness of our world and our collective grief and mourning that things uh, are, are not just in our individual lives are broken, but things in our world are broken as well. And this is what we've all been experiencing together over this past year. 
The experience of grieving over the brokenness of our world should not be unfamiliar to the followers of Jesus, but often we need to be reminded of that reality and what God does for us in that reality. And what's fascinating is that some of us look around uh, and, and we become fighters and we think, I'm going to try even harder to fix the world around me. I'm going to fight and I'm going to do what I think it's be- what's best no matter what. I'm still in control. And then there may be those who lose all hope, thinking all is lost and nothing is going to work out. Both extremes fail to recognize Jesus' point here. One commentator I read this week wrote this, Only such persons as are deeply convicted of the sinfulness of sin feel the plague of their own heart and turn with disgust away from worldly consolations because of their insufficiency to render themselves happy have God's promise of solid comfort. Yikes. Uh, That's well said and it's really unsettling. So how is your heart these days? Are you fighting for control? Are you fed up with the world around you? Have you given up? Are you you willing to cry out to God this morning, recognizing that only he has what we need for each day, for each moment, for our eternal reality and the world around us? You can trust God. He is good. Uh, And that same commentator that I just mentioned finished his paragraph writing this. They shall be comforted, says Christ. He, Jesus, will call them to himself and speak the words of pardon and peace and life eternal to their hearts. Now that's good news. And it's available for you and for me, for all of us this morning, through the love of Jesus. So as we're thinking about this, I want to take a look at a moment in the life of Peter. It's one where the outcome is incredibly encouraging and will help us see the character of God as he comforts those who are mourning. So uh, uh, we need some uh, comfort these days, don't we? On many levels, we've all experienced loss over the past year. For some of us, it's been the loss of our routine, our normal social structures, not being in person with our family, our friends, our church. We've experienced the loss of celebrating things like anniversaries or birthdays, holidays, weddings, and even funerals. For some, the loss has been income or jobs, health, even precious and dear loved ones. No matter what your experience of loss has been over the past year, all of us, if we are being honest, have experienced a sense of mourning. And the good news, as we read in Matthew 5, is that Jesus acknowledges those who mourn, number one, and two, uh, says that God's going to do something about it. So in Mark 14, verse 66 through 72, we have this very familiar story from the life of Peter. At this point in the story, Jesus has been arrested and he's been put on trial. After that, we find Peter being confronted in a courtyard about his relationship with Jesus. Now, before I read this passage, I want to take you into the story. I want to take you to Jerusalem and show you the scene that's described in this story. Because... I want us to get a sense of what Peter was feeling in this moment. And, and I think that he can relate uh, to the sense of mourning that, and the loss that we've all felt over this past year. A few years ago, I got to, uh, had the opportunity to go to Jordan and Israel and to visit many of the incredible places described in the Bible. One of the most moving for me was to visit the place, the jail, where they think that Jesus was held after his trial before he was taken to be crucified on the cross. So under this palace that was likely the house of Caiaphas, the high priest at the time, is this dungeon. And in that dungeon, there are a number of holding cells. Now, I'm going to show you a short video of the one that they're pretty sure that Jesus was in for up to six hours before being taken away to be crucified. It was basically a big hole in this rock, and it had one entrance, which they would have had to have lowered Jesus down into the cell by rope around his shoulders. They've installed stairs now, uh, and we were able to gather inside that cell where Jesus was held. Uh, and in this video, you're going to hear Pastor Eric Spangler reading from Psalm 88, a powerful psalm that Jesus would have known well in that cell. Who lie in the grave whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. 
You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I, have con I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness? Or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? It was unbelievable to be there. Knowing Jesus had likely been there in that space in the last hours of his life um, and, and that he was thinking about what he was doing for the sake of us all, I was moved to tears. And then we exited. And as we exited, we were led out into a courtyard. Yes, very likely the same courtyard where we read this story. Meanwhile, Peter was in the courtyard below. One of the servant girls who worked for the high priest came by and noticed Peter warming himself by the fire. She looked at him closely and said, You were one of those with Jesus of Nazareth. But Peter denied it. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. And he went out into the entryway. Just then, the rooster crowed. When the servant girl saw him standing there, she began telling others, This man is definitely one of them. But Peter denied it again. A little later, some of the bystanders confronted Peter and said, You must be one of them because you're a Galilean. Peter swore, A curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know this man you're talking about. And immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. Suddenly, Jesus' words flashed before Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even knew me. And he, Peter, broke down and wept. So the first place that we went to after experiencing this incredibly powerful moment in the life of Jesus, in the place where while Jesus was in the midst of agony about, to, about what was about to happen to him, was this courtyard, this courtyard where Peter denied him. Peter was afraid and, and looking out for himself. Again, I was moved to tears. I began to mourn because I'm so much like Peter. Hello. Behind me, you can see uh, the church that uh, they believe was Caiaphas' house. Uh, this is the place where Jesus was brought after his trial with the Sanhedrin and uh, was held uh, in the dungeon for up to about six hours. Uh, we were able just to go down into that dungeon. And uh, while we were down in that dungeon, it's a deep pit. They had to let Jesus down into the bottom of this pit through by tying a rope around his waist, and lowering him down into this pit. It was dark, wet, and we while we were down there, we read Psalm 88 about uh, some of the things uh, that uh, Jesus um, felt. Uh, I was very moved being in there, that this is the place that really started that next part of Jesus' journey all the way to the cross. And you can see uh, even behind me in this courtyard here, um, this courtyard commemorates uh, Peter's denial of Jesus. There's a statue you can see just behind this tree. Um, uh, that is Peter uh, being asked questions um, if he was one of the followers of Jesus and he denies three times. This is possibly the courtyard where that outside, um, where uh, Peter denied Jesus three times. It's pretty amazing that we are uh, walking these steps, uh, visiting the dungeon, and are here. It's very moving for me to think about and for us to think about what it is that Christ is doing, knowingly doing, taking these steps um, for the salvation of us all. It's incredible. Thanks. Did you notice what Peter did after he denied Jesus? It says that uh, he broke down and wept. 
Some translations say that he wept bitterly. He's mourning. In fact, it's the same type of mourning that Jesus references in the Beatitudes. It's the same type. It's the same word here. It's incredible. He's experiencing both things that we've talked about. He's afraid and his actions have separated him from relationship with Jesus. And then he feels this deep sense of loss. So he weeps bitterly. Again, it's the same concept as what we find Jesus referencing in this beatitude. So we can relate to Peter here, can't we? But watch what Jesus does. Let's jump ahead a few chapters and look at this, uh, at something amazing. This next passage comes from after Jesus was crucified. As far as Peter and the disciples know at this point in the story, Jesus is dead and buried. Mary Magdalene and a few others go to visit the tomb. And what they find is that Jesus is not there. He's risen. And then they have this incredible conversation with an angel. It says this, Saturday evening, when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. Very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On the way, they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But as they arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in white robe, in a white robe, sitting on the right side. The women were shocked, but the angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go tell the disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. So did you notice that at the end there? What did the angel say? He said, now go tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee and you will see him there just as he told you before he died. Now, here's a question. Have you ever thought about this? Why would the angel single out Peter here? Is it because he's no longer considered to be part of the disciples? No. In fact, in John 21, we read the story of the well-known story of the reinstatement of Peter after Jesus uh, is risen from the dead. No, what I think is happening here is that this is a picture of God's particular comforting to the heart of one of his beloved friends who's mourning. This is so beautiful. In this seminal moment in the history of humanity, when Mary and her friends are first hearing about the powerful saving work of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the angel says, don't forget to tell Peter. Wow. One commentary I read this week said, this moment is not intended to exclude Peter from the disciples, but rather to ensure that Peter gets the message. God is hunting down the miserable Peter because he wants to have mercy on him. There it is. The, it, the, the moment in the middle of the story of salvation where God shows us who he is and remains true to his promise to comfort those who mourn. Incredible. So how's your heart this morning? We've all been in mourning to some degree this past year. Things are beginning to change. And, and you know what God did for Peter in that incredible moment that he can and will do for you and for us as well. God will and is hunting down our mourning hearts this morning because he wants to have mercy on us. Isn't that incredible? So as you, as we come to the end of this message, as we think about this incredible moment between the angel and, and Mary and her friends, that God's trying to comfort the heart of, of Peter who, who uh, denied Christ and is in mourning after that, that we can be encouraged that that same God can and will do that for us. So how's your heart this morning? Let's, let's hold open those things that we're mourning, that we're, 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 uh, we're, we're sad, we're grieving over from this past year. Let's hold those open to God, trusting that he will, he can and will do something about it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the way that you weave together the story of Scripture so that we can see your truth revealed in what you, uh, in how you work in this world and in our hearts. 
And so, God, uh, we come knowing on these two levels that, one, we grieve over the sin in our life that keep us separated from you. We ask your forgiveness. We know that you are faithful to forgive and, and bring that reconciling work through the power of your Spirit. God, on the other hand, there are many things that we mourn and grieve over, losses from this past year. You care about those as well. And so we thank you for the work that you do pursuing us, as that commentator said, hunting us down to show mercy and compassion on our lives. We thank you that you are a God who loves us that deeply. We turn to you. Uh, we ask you uh, for your loving presence. And we give you all the praise. In your name we pray. Amen. to enter together into a time of communion now. So if you haven't already, and uh, now would be the time to make sure you have some bread and some juice uh, prepared for this time. You know, communion for followers of Jesus is a sacrament. It's a means of grace, a time for us to remember uh, as we share together the body of Christ broken for us, the blood of Christ poured out for us. Uh, a time for us to come together in remembrance of what Jesus has done for us. 
Communion is, uh, is a meal to be shared together. And in this time of remembrance, uh, we also recognize the presence of Jesus with us. He promised he would be with us always. And in communion, we're very aware of Jesus's presence, that he is with us in our fellowship with one another as we share in this meal, and that he is with us, uh, his presence is with us in our very life and very spirit. Let's share in this time of communion with one another. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this to remember me. Let's take the bread together. He did the same thing with the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Every time you drink it, do this to remember me. Let's drink the cup together. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you have done for us on the cross. Thank you that in your sacrifice of your broken body and your shed blood, that we are forgiven of our sins and that we have the hope of new life and eternal life with you. Thank you for this gift of communion, this time to remember what you have done for us, this time to fellowship with one another and to experience and recognize your presence among us. We are so grateful, Lord, for your love and your great mercy. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.
Crossview. Welcome to Church Online this morning. Hi, Isaac. Hi, Hi Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> well, no one's going to know. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs>